Let's consider the ammonia synthesis reaction. For a series of elementary steps shown here, where we have dissociative adsorption of nitrogen, dissociative adsorption of hydrogen, and then sequential hydrogen addition steps on the surface to nitrogen until we make ammonia. So we can write the rate, assuming any one of the steps is the rate limiting step with all others quasi-equilibrated, and the rate that we'll actually observe will be the one dictated by the lowest rate among all of these predictions. So let's do this for step one. We can write that the rate is equal to the rate of step one, which is equal to the forward rate, K1, times the pressure of nitrogen, times the vacant site coverage squared, times one minus an approach to equilibrium. The approach to equilibrium is simply the pressure of products over the pressure of reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficients times one over the equilibrium constant for the entire reaction. The equilibrium constant for the overall reaction is the product of the equilibrium constants for each elementary step raised to their stoichiometric numbers. So how many times that step happens in one catalytic turnover. The vacant site coverage in our rate equation we can find using a site balance, taking into account the coverage of all the different species on our catalyst surface, free sites, adsorbed hydrogen, adsorbed nitrogen, adsorbed NH, NH2, and adsorbed ammonia. We can write expressions for all these different coverages in terms of measurable quantities, and these depend on the respective equilibrium constants for all of these elementary steps which we took to be quasi-equilibrated, so in this case everything except step one. So the key point here is that our rate is gonna be a function of the rate constant for nitrogen dissociation, step one, and it's going to be a function of equilibrium constants for all of our additional equilibrated steps. So we can write an Arrhenius type relationship for our rate constant K1, so it's gonna be equal to some pre-exponential factor times E to the minus EA over RT, where this is the activation energy for nitrogen dissociation. For each of our equilibrium constants, we can write these as e to the minus delta g of reaction over RT, or some pre-exponential factor k0 times e to the minus delta e of reaction over RT. It's important to note that the adsorption energies of each of our different intermediates can be related to our reaction energies. And then the linear scaling relations tell us that the adsorption energies of NHx are a linear function of the adsorption energy of nitrogen. And here we've seen how we can quantitatively predict this slope based on the valence rule. And so this would be two thirds for NH and one third for NH2. The bronsted evans polanyi relationships also allow us to relate the activation energy for nitrogen dissociation to the binding energy of nitrogen. So if we go to a catalyst that binds nitrogen strongly, it will lower the barrier for N2 dissociation, whereas a noble catalyst that binds nitrogen weakly will have a high barrier for nitrogen dissociation. So what these scaling relations allow us to do is now map our rate as a function of just one variable, the adsorption energy of nitrogen. So what this allows us to do is plot the rate as a function of just one descriptor, this nitrogen binding energy. So here we've plotted the rate versus nitrogen binding energy. And again, this will be the lowest rate dictated by assuming any one of the different elementary steps is rate limiting. So the convention here is that from right to left, we are going to stronger nitrogen binding. And so on the right side of our volcano plot, we have weakly binding catalysts. And on the left side, we have strongly binding catalysts. So putting some different metals on here, going from nickel to cobalt to rhodium to ruthenium, increasing the surface affinity for nitrogen lowers the activation energy for dissociating nitrogen. Essentially, K1 is increasing as we make the nitrogen binding stronger. On the left side of our activity volcano, we find metals like iron and molybdenum. So here, increasing surface affinity leads to a reduction in the number of vacant sites on the catalyst surface, which we need to dissociate our nitrogen. So increasing nitrogen binding energy here actually hurts activity. So the optimal catalyst binds nitrogen not too strongly and not too weakly. So here, neither activation of reactant nor the availability of surface sites is limiting rate too much. So we can use this to example, describe why nickel is not an effective catalyst for ammonia synthesis. So here, since it binds nitrogen too weakly, the barrier for N2 dissociation is too high. We can also think about questions like how the activity volcano would change as we increase temperature. So at a higher temperature, our activity volcano might look something like shown here in purple. So we can see two differences. The maximum activity is higher, and the optimal binding energy shifts to stronger binding. So since desorption is favored at higher temperatures, going to stronger binding can increase the nitrogen dissociation rates without leading to too high of coverages. So this volcano relationship both allows us to 
qualitatively understand why different catalysts are better than one another, and it gives us a quantitative prediction of where we need to be in adsorption energy to design the best catalysts.